Hello and welcome. I'm Kamla. On today's show, we are talking about wines from Silicon Valley. Technology is not the only thing Silicon Valley is famous for. Silicon Valley also is the oldest wine growing region in California. And with me today is Jean Guglielmo. Did I say that right? Oh, you're good. I think you've got a partial Italian in you there. I tell you, I must have been an Italian. That's it. That's it. <laughs> so, yes. Jean, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate that. Yours is one of the oldest wineries of Santa Clara Santa Valley. Santa Clara Valley, correct. Okay. Yeah, the, we're actually the oldest continuously family operated winery in Santa Clara Valley. So the key, key word is continuously operating. Right. By the same family. By the same family. Right. But there have been other wineries They're that are a little bit older, yes. Okay. Yeah. So why is it that we don't associate Silicon Valley and Santa Clara County with wineries and wine? Well, why do we go north, east, and south? Well, because those regions got a little jump as far as the promotion of, of their areas as wine country. I mean, 60, 70 years ago, spending a lot of money on TV, advertising, come up to the wine country. Well. We're in wine country here, but uh, we didn't spend the money to promote this area as a wine country. We promoted money to for the tech industry. Well, that that too, but that's later on. That came later, but mm. the industry has been here for many, many years, and mm. the consumer has changed. So the interest in wine has grown so much as well. So, uh, you know, the Italians all knew that there was wineries down in. Santa Clara Valley, but uh, That's not right. everybody else. That's <laughs> so. right. So your grandpa came what, at the turn of uh, the 19th century? Well, about 1907. Okay. He left a little village up in the Piemonte region of Which uh, is Piedmont. Piedmont. Okay. Uh, region of northern Italy along the French border. And uh, it, he just left with uh, a lot of ambition, and that was about it. Wanted to improve his, uh, his future and his family's future, so he left, came over and landed in New York and he uh, had determined that they were, he was going to settle in San Francisco or make it to the, you know, to the West land Coast. of opportunity here in California, which we're glad he did. So he worked his way across the United States because he didn't have any money. So he worked at different jobs, uh, s getting enough money to take the next step in his journey. So he eventually ended up in San Francisco. and. A lot of immigrants of that era had decided to, you know, they thought they were going to scoop up the gold on the side of the road and go back to Italy, and I think that might have been his plan at the time. Were, but were there stories like that, that there was gold by the side well, of the I road? Mean, no, I'm know, just curious. You know, end of the gold rush and all that kind of stuff, and the opportunity. So you can imagine what the Bay so Area... So they thought the streets were paved with gold? Well, well probably. <laughs> well, they knew that, that there was great opportunity here. And that's what uh, was his his big push to come out. And, uh, Isn't that interesting? That well, it's very interesting. It's amazing, you know, that uh, to have that dedication because he left all his family there. Was and he married? No, he wasn't married then. But he had my grandmother was. They were, I guess, engaged. So he was probably gonna. He said, well, "I'll be back in a few years with a bunch of money." But uh, he ended up staying here and sending for her. So she came over by herself. Where, to the East Coast? To, no, to San Francisco. Oh, so she and landed here she, directly. Yeah, and they got married in 1910 in San Francisco. So oh, right after the earthquake, right? Was, when well, was they, the earthquake? Yeah, they waited till it was safe. And okay, and, San Fr and this area has traditionally, uh, and when I say traditionally, going back 100 years, uh, this was a big pull for a lot of Italian immigrants, mostly from northern, uh, northern Italy? Well, from all parts of Italy. Most of the s southern Italians did the fishing and you know, more in the coastal areas, but farmers from, I mean, this is the land of heart's delight. I mean, there's, you can grow almost anything here, and it was a big draw. And so at that time, uh, they, f they came and planted orchards and vineyards, and they could make a, an honest living in such a great valley because we have perfect perfect conditions for growing almost any crop but for wine especially because we've got great soil good weather and uh, perfect is this climate. one of the best valleys in the world well, in terms of growing probably one of the most fertile valleys areas of it are and that's why it's known as heart's delight valley of heart's delight yeah because you can grow almost anything here and so there was a lot of great so what did your products. grandfather do when he came well, to San Well, when he first came over, he worked different jobs. But uh, one of the jobs he got was actually uh, working for a tannery. 
because it was a butcher town in San Francisco. So we have a picture at the winding, which I think you saw, that right. shows them with the whole horse-drawn uh, wagon, which was a big wagon because he was hauling hides from butcher town to the tannery. So, and, this and he was saved his money. This was in the early teens, and uh, my grandmother worked as well. She worked at a French laundry, and so they just saved up their money. Hard-working people. Hard-working people. They came here to work and to get ahead. So, so this was, he lived in San Francisco. Which part of San Francisco were the tannery? Well, uh, the, the tannery was out closer to where the butcher town was, uh, by Old Candlestick Park, out in that area. Oh, Old Candlestick Park. That's where all the slaughterhouses were in that, on 3rd Street there. But I don't know exactly where the tannery was, but I'm sure it wasn't too far from there because that's where they took the, the hides. So, I, so I San Francisco's changed a little bit. I mean, the, they used to run the, the cattle down the street, you know, because the trains would unload and they'd run them right down the tracks and to the slaughterhouses. Oh, really? So, yeah, yeah. Did, 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 well, I well, guess I mean, you wouldn't have seen it. Ago, you you wouldn't sure. have seen it. Okay. No, no. Okay, and then your grandfather bought uh, this land down in Morgan Hill, which is the southern tip of uh, Santa Clara County. Well, it's kind of, yeah, just almost the southern tip. Yeah. Santa Clara Valley runs all the way from Palo Alto all the way down to Pass Gilroy. Pa yeah, and so that it's is. So a huge. And that, is the, and that is the county also. Palo Alto is one end at the yeah. northern side, which is right. famous for all its startups. Yeah, so and it's a big county, and, and uh, the, the heart of it is ideal for, for growing world-class wine grapes. So. And so your grandfather bought the... A small vineyard. There was 15 acres there and a small house with a tank house and a small barn. That's all that was there. So but this was during the uh, Prohibition era. Uh, yes, it was. Yes, it was. Well, that's actually what got him started in the wine business because there was such a demand and obviously not much of a supply. So it was a great opportunity. Demand so where? He had dem demand for wine. But yeah. where? Who, 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 who demanded that wine? <laughs> well, was it the, the church? Year, all the and medicinal you know, reasons? We always said he was uh, made it for the churches and his friends. And he was very religious and <laughs> had a lot of friends. But... <laughs> <laughs> no, it was primarily his, his customer base was the European culture because wine was uh, a food. Yeah. It was part of the meal. It was just part of, of their living. Okay. And uh, it was actually legal to make wine for your own home, home consumption. Yeah. So it wasn't In fact, that, that was not uh, prohibited, actually. No, no, you that was actually legal, so it was proper. But a lot of people okay. didn't want to go to that trouble, so he uh, started, you know, producing wine and, and distributing it primarily in San Francisco. Oh, so he distributed it to San Francisco. Yeah, he would. He How would they take it? How would they take the wine? Well, it took a long time because all you had was the El Camino Real. You didn't have any freeways. So he would take it up by car. That is over 100 odd miles. Right, so that was a big journey. Yeah, yeah. I mean, today we can travel an hour and a half from San Francisco to Gilroy, but if you're down. in those days. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. And then he had a uh, full basement in his house in, in San Francisco where he would, he had barrels. And I mean, when he first started out, that they delivered a lot of stuff in barrels. They didn't even bottle it. They would bring barrels to different families. Like beer and casks and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, wooden Same barrels. Oh, wooden, wooden barrels. barrels. Oh, yeah, okay. Smaller ones, not the, the yeah, yeah, yeah. larger ones, but that's how it he actually started and get the wine around. So yeah, it's a very interesting story. And uh, I, I just remember one story my dad told me that uh, he w my grandfather was out delivering wine one, uh, one, one night, late evening. And I guess it was foggy and he took a wrong turn and he pulls up to this gate and, and uh, he looks up and it was San Quentin. <laughs> so I think, you made a, I think you made a quick turnaround there. And but how did he land up in the Richmond area? Did he, go, the, he, he wouldn't have gone to up El Camino. He must have gone uh, now around, by, yeah. Or ah, the okay. ferries. They had ferries, I think, to yes, bring they them did. across. Yes, yeah. they did. What was your grandfather's name? My grandfather's name was Emilio. Emilio. And my grandmother's name was Emilia. Oh, made for so each Emilio other. Emilio and Emilia. They were made and for each married other. married in 1910. So it's kind of interesting. And then another little side note is, uh, you know, my grandparents came here to be Americans. So my dad happened to be born on George Washington, his birthday. So they named him George Washington Guglielmo. I mean, is that not wanting to be American? It is. So it is. 
<laughs> people don't believe it. What? Yeah, yeah. No, that's how he got to be George W. <laughs> oh. George Washington. Oh, he was George W. No, I didn't right. say the Washington, it's just George W. Guillermo. Right. So then Washington. in 1933, prohibition was uh, lifted, and right. then your grandfather he put all his bonded. energy. Right. He became bonded. And what does it mean when you say you became bonded? Well, you get a license, and then you have to put up a bond because there's tax on the wine, so you have to have a bonded permit. Even today? So you have even today. Okay. Right. right. So he became so bonded, and then he started expanding the... The distribution. The distribution. And the production. Okay. Because he was able to make it there in Morgan Hill, transport it up. Because before, he couldn't make enough. He'd, he would buy wine from other uh, producers and then bring it in and blend it and okay. put it in barrels and deliver it. So, so these would be jug wine? What primarily, a pr our table first wine. label were good, solid table wines, very food friendly to go along with the, uh, the European culture and the type of food that they eat. Okay. Then so your, your father went to World War II, came back, and then became involved in the winery. Right. Right, became full-time partner with my grandfather. What was his contribution? How did he expand the uh, he wine did a lot business? Of, he did a lot of things. He was very uh, progressive, and we've, he updated faci you know, our facilities. We expanded, so we've expanded our storage capacity, and all our equipment was upgraded, which we've kept that, that uh, tradition going of so always getting the best equipment that you know, the top quality equipment and uh, to make the best wine we can. So he was very progressive in that. He put one of the first stainless steel fermentation systems in in the uh, late 60s, which was kind of ahead of his time. So so the, that's very interesting because we talk about Silicon Valley and technology, but one of the things that happened in the agriculture industry in California, especially in this area, was the use of technology right in the 20th century, right from the start of the 20th century. And you mentioned that your gran uh, your father uh, brought in all these new techniques and technology. Well, just upgrading, they've, they've learned so much with the, uh, the actual fermentation process of, you know, chemically what is going and what happens. So they're able to really zero in and, and improve techniques and ways to make the best wine possible. What did your grandfather think of all these new changes that your father was introducing? Well, I, you know, you got two Italians there, you know, but uh, they had different views, but they, uh, they loved each other, and, you know, you got to change with the times. You got to go with what's going on around So was you, there so. resistance from your grandfather? No, you not no? really. He kind of stepped back and let my dad go forward. Okay. So. What are your memories of your grandfather and of this area, which, when you were growing up, was known as uh, Valley of Heart's Delight? Well, I think it was a much simpler life then. I just remember as a child that, see, our customers were all, they were like friends. They would come down, a lot of them from San Francisco would make the journey down to come to the winery, and my grandmother would cook them lunch. So they would spend, you know, the day there. And I remember in the evenings they'd have, uh, we had a little patio area, on the, which is now our event area, but, you know, having dinners or barbecues and, having the accordion going and singing. It was much simpler, and they enjoyed their lives. You still they have that? They worked hard. Yeah, we still have that. Do you still have the accordion? Uh, I, I, I never took, they didn't make me take accordion lessons, <laughs> but I got a lot of recorded music of accordion because my dad loved it, so I got a lot of tapes of accordion music, and friends that used to play it would come by and, and play, and they'd sing the old Italian song. So it was really, it was a great experience as a small child because I was only six, seven years old so mm. but that lifestyle was uh, I, I admired because they worked hard and they, they enjoyed their friends and loved their family and and shared it mm. you know, shared that love mm. we're so sometimes we're so caught up in today's pace that we stop to really appreciate the small things in life which are so important mm. now in the 60s there was a change in the way wine was being made you s you changed the label I guess well what we did is we we my brother, my older brother George, who went to Fresno State, um, which has the Enology and, and Viticulture program, which Davis and Fresno were the two schools that really specialized in winemaking and grape growing. Um, he went to the to Fresno State and got uh, up, you know new technologies and uh, uh, both in the vineyard and the winemaking side, and then we we could see a little change in the 
consumer. There was more interest in pure varietal wines as opposed to blended wines. So we started a, an actual varietal program in 69 was the first year that we actually kept the records separate because you have to have records from the day that you crush the wines to the day you bottle it so that you can prove that that wine went all the way to the bottle. So to make sure everything is Mm. Right. And so when we talk varietals, that's what we're all used to today, you know. Right. In, in, in today's age, we say, oh, that's a cab, you know, that's a Merlot. Well, we've, we've be, be, uh, become familiar with varietal names. Okay. So before it was like Burgundy or blended wines, and there's still a little uh, comeback with, uh, with blended wines, some of the Meritages and Clarets and different things that are put together. So there's nothing wrong with a blended wine. Okay. What do you remember of the blind tasting of 1976 in Paris, which is what put California on the map as far as wines went? Well, I think it was a, a fantastic. I was very excited about it, but it's something we'd known all along. So no, it was but not when the, the, the event happened uh, in 76, do you recollect what the conversation was around in your house uh, with your father and you? Well, we were excited about it because the fact, like I say, we, we knew that California made great wines, and it's just great to finally get discovered as a wine region, world-class wine region. So mm. that's the same thing like Santa Clara Valley. Our valley makes great wines. It's just we have to have more people discover that. Mm. So, so do you know the folks up in uh, Cupertino, the Ridge, uh, Ridge Winery? Uh, I don't know, uh, you know. Okay, because I think one of their wines was featured in the 76 uh, blind tasting. Okay, but you do know Charles uh, Sullivan, who yeah, is yeah, I've uh, met him. Yes, who is yes, documented a good historian. He's been a uh, a friend over the years of Santa Clara Valley since he knows so much about it and the wine history that is present in this valley. So mm. it's an inter uh, interesting book. Mm, it is, really but this is the companion. Uh, this is a companion to California wine. Uh, so when we fast forward, so. In the 60s, you, have, you, you know, there was a change in the label. Then the 70s, California wines were discovered. What, what happened in the last 25 years? How have you all grown? What is different about your wines? And how many labels do you have? I know I'm asking way too many questions. No, that's OK. <laughs> well, we've, we've stuck with our oldest label, which is the Emile's label, which yep. kind of relates to the, the blended wine. So we still make what we call a heritage red right now, which is a, a blend of top quality varietals that is a fair, you know, fairly reasonably priced uh, red and white wine that you can have with a, a wide range of foods. Okay. And the story behind the, the Emile's label is even though my grandfather's name was Emilio, my grandparents both spoke French as well as Italian. So a lot of his early customers were French. So they all called him Emile. So he goes, well, I'll go with that. And at that time, I think it was a little more fashionable to be French than than Italian, because everybody took their turn in the barrel, like <laughs> I mentioned to you, a little prejudice there. So <coughs> he's just went with the Emile's private stock. So we've we've kept that label, and we use it not only for those blended wines, but for champagnes and a few other items. You make almond champagne. Mm-hmm. Is mm -hmm. it also called Emile? It's Emile's, right. Well, tell me about this almond champagne. I'd never seen it until I went down to... It's, it's become very popular. It's just a flavored cuvee. Uh, you know, and what is a cuvee? Cuvee is the blend of, of grapes that go into the, your, your champagne. Okay. And then they, they uh, inject uh, or add uh, extract of almond. So you get the almond flavor and the residual sugar is up a little higher than our other two champagnes. So it's very popular. Okay, so you have the Emile label. That's the Emile's label, which is uh, like I, I explained to you. And then our, our next level up is we call it our tray label. TRE. TRE, which is three in Italian, and that represents uh, there's we've got two brothers, my younger brother Gary and George and myself, so that's three. And then we're the third generation. So the three ties in two ways. And that really is a Central Coast selection of. Uh, premium varietals at a, at a very competitive price. That is all grown in your estate? No, not on our estate. It's oh, all it's Central it's Coast, okay, so okay. D depending on which variety, we, we select the best grapes we can within the Central Coast to fit into that 
price So does point. that change? Does, does the varietal change? Uh, no, no, the varietals year? stay the same. We do a Cabernet, a Chardonnay, a Merlot. Okay. And so we, the varietals stay the same. Okay. And, and the, and the, and the uh, source of fruit pretty and the much third stays one? the same too. And the, the third one is our private reserve. It's Guglielmo. We use the family name. And it's the private reserve. Label. So th these are private reserves? These are the private reserves, and these are mostly all Santa Clara Valley Appalachian, and uh, all our own grapes go into the private reserve label. Why is it called private reserve? Please educate me. Why is it called private reserve? Because it's very limited, and those are our best efforts as well. So, uh, so it's, it's not an endless supply. So Got you. It's so it's like a limited reserve. edition. It's like a limited edition. It's our own family private selection mm. of wines that we put in our top label. And you, your wines are available not only in locally but also around the country. We're in about four or five states. Four or five uh, states. Other than California, and we do a little bit of export, Japan and, and China. Tell me about it. Why Japan and China? They seem kind of very interesting places to be in. Uh, we were approached, and you know, there's a, uh, the acceptance of California wine worldwide has has helped, and uh, the interest has been sparked, and so we've made them available to people that have approached us. So, mm, and mm. The, the Japanese are learning more and more about wine, and their interest is is growing, and uh, it's like breaking in into their culture. Mm. So. So should we try one of the wines? Well, yeah, that's the fun part. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a reserve, which means limited edition. Well, this one is a reserve, and it's also a state bottled. Okay. So that means that the grapes were grown right on our state there in Morgan Hill. Okay. And, and it is the private reserve designation. Okay. And this is a unique one I brought along because it's made from the Granulino grape. What is Granulino grape? That is an actual Italian variety that comes from the area of Italy that we're from. Piedmont. Piedmont, yeah, P Piedmont. Piedmonte. I say Piemonte, but okay. Piedmont. Yeah. So it's a, a grape that's spe it's kind of special to us because my grandfather planted it, and we've been making it for many, many years. And we make it in a red, which is from you know we leave it on the vine a little longer and ferment it with the skins, and then we make a rosé out of it. So we p pick it at a little lower sugar and just ferment the juice, leave it on the skins just to pick up a little color, and then ferment it. Okay. We make it this particular wine in a nice dry style, so it's very food, you know, friendly. You can have it by itself or with, with food. So with it's kind of unique, and it's got a nice floral, floral uh, aspect to it. So, so this and I is love a the color. Yeah, you, so you got to say Guglielmo Gregnolino. Guglielmo Gregnolino. Yeah, that's a tongue bene, twister. Bene. Yeah, <laughs> fa bravo. <laughs> so this is a twist stop. Yeah, now the, we use the twist off on a few of the varietals and primarily for wines that we're going to be, we uh, anticipate being consumed very, very soon. Aren't you going to try? Oh, well, I don't want you drinking alone, yes. So we should look for the color? Well, the big component of wine is the aroma, is the okay. smell. You pick up a lot of characteristics. You get almost a little fruit, a little floral aspect to it in the nose. Mm. Uh, you got to let it aerate a little bit so you'll, it'll get up in the glass. Ah, okay. And do we look for legs in, s in these kind of wines and rosé? Yeah, you can just, it's usually in a lighter style, you don't look so much for the legs. Where do you look for the legs? In the darker? The heavier, the heavier bodied okay. reds. Do I smell some herbs? Mm hmm. Yeah, there's some spice in there as well. And so now I get I a little bit of fruitiness. That's what I like about this wine. It is dry, like you said. Right. Okay. What are the descriptors for this wine? How would you describe it? You you said it's well, got, it's got fruitiness. a light acid. It's got some f fruit components to it. Floral floral compo components. Good balance. Mm. Nice acid on the finish, so that it goes well with food. So we. Now you can make rosés in a sweeter style, leave more residual sugar, but that's not always the best scenario for capturing um, full character of the, because sweetness covers up what's in the grape itself. And then it doesn't go along with the, a lot of foods. 
What prompted you all to make this wine? My dad decided to make this wine. So we used to make it sweeter because people in you know the early part of the consumer history figured rosé was always going to be sweet. So he made it with a little higher residual sugar. And the, over the years, we've dried it out to make it more fruit friendly and let some of the other characteristics of the Granulino grape, grape come through. And it's a lovely color. Yeah, and rosés are becoming very popular. Okay. So you can't judge a, a wine by the Water. color. Oh. By the color. Okay. So okay. you you know just because it's rosé doesn't mean or it's a pink doesn't mean it's sweet. Mm. So we're not going to have time to test this wine, but since we are not going to uh, taste it, how would you describe this wine? Well, this one is a, a lighter red style. This is a Sangiovese, which is a, it's a Santa Clara one. This is the one we grew right on our vineyards, but it is Santa Clara Valley. So our private reserve label, we, we try really to, we're trying to maintain the Santa Clara Valley, app, you know, Appalachian is our, our flagship. So this is a lighter style red. It's got a little bit of fruit to it, a little bit of acid, good balance. This is uh, the basic, that's an Italian variety, but this is grown here in Santa Clara Valley, but it's a, it's a good spaghetti red. Spaghetti red. You know, it's red. not real, real heavy. And this is the component, main component of the uh, Chiantes of Italy. So that's where, where you, you can kind of relate it to, an, uh, to a wine that you've probably tasted before. But Gee. it's very popular. We sell a lot of it. Of this wine. Of the Sangiovese, yeah. Gene, thank you so much for stopping by and showing us a different aspect of Silicon Valley. It's not all tech. Oh, it's also no, wine. It's not all tech. No, <laughs> it's all wine. This the thing is that you've got to uh, expand your horizons and experiment a little bit and go out. And we've got a lot of history in Santa Clara Valley and a, and a lot of great personalities. And you, you can come and actually meet a winemaker on your tour. <laughs> our wine trail has about 30 wineries on it. So get on our webpage, Wineries of Santa Clara Valley, and come see us. Gene, thank you so much for stopping by. It was a pleasure. Yeah, my pleasure. And thank you for watching. We'll be back again with another edition of our show. Until then, goodbye.